Okay, uh, hi, welcome to my talk. My name is Eloisa Guerrero, or I, come, I go as E.L. Guerrero, and I changed the name of my talk because it was very self-referential and um, kind of inception in a way. But uh, what I want to talk about is what we talk about when we talk about our language. And what I mean by that is what we're actually saying when we say things, and what are the implications of the language we use day to day. So what are we talking about? Our language has a long history of oppression, and this isn't just in publishing or in tech, uh, but in daily life. And it's a problem that impacts the people we work with and even our friends, uh, our families, our colleagues. Uh, so this isn't just um, strictly just for technology or all these terminologies used in science and academic publishing. So. What can we do about it? I'm going to frame it within tech and scholarly publishing just to be, uh, just to scope it just a bit more. Um, but it's also, let's also be mindful of uh, how we use language outside of work. So who am I and why this talk? I'm a software developer at PKP and I've always questioned uh, the language that, that we've inherited uh, and how we've internalized all this racism, ableism, sexism, all sorts of isms in our daily lives. And I have a lot to learn, and I want to talk about this with you so we can begin to make things better, not just for ourselves, but for the people who are affected by the way we use our language, the way we've been so used to using these words that are actually very harmful. So what's the problem? Um, for example, uh, I come from the Philippines, and in the Philippines, Philipp uh, we, ironically, we were colonized by Spain for 300 years. Um, so in the Philippines during that time, uh, they used Spanish to uh, determine societal status. If you were uh, a colonizer, you would speak Spanish. If you were the colonized, you would speak your, our, our own indigenous language. Um, it, and, and for those Filipinos who knew how to speak Spanish, they had a, like, it was a very much upper tier uh, uh, social class for them. And um, we were also required to change our names to Spanish, hence my Spanish name. Um, so there was a lot of, there's a long history of uh, this colonization and oppression using language. And it applies the same to the terminologies that, that we've been handed down. And um, so much so that it's become normal for us to use these terms. In Canada, uh, indigenous people's uh, culture and language is in danger of being taken away from them. So it's, it's not just something that's been handed down, but it's something that, that constantly happens in the world all around the world today. Uh, so it's not only historical. We use language as a tool, and knowingly or unknowingly, we negatively impact marginalized people. And um, we shouldn't use the excuse, just because we've always said X is this way, then we should just keep it. No, I don't think that, that we should follow uh, these uh, historical oppressive languages. And I think that we should question and make things better for people, because it definitely will impact people in ways that we may not know, because we all have different lived experiences. So uh, I want to show some real world examples uh, where we can see this in tech and scholarly publishing. So here's uh, a, a screenshot of uh, a site that's asking me to excuse me, whitelist their site or disable my ad blocking software. Um, the terms blacklist and whitelist have always been used uh, in technology, but they have very racist connotations because we're often using black to denote something as bad and white as something that is good. And anti-black racism is still very pervasive and they, they are subtle terms that perpetuate that um, black is always good, even black sheep or any other term that uses black to say it's, it's something that's bad. And uh, this cycles back into our daily lives. Again, we, we think that they are very harmless words, but they actually 
carry a lot of weight, a, a lot of historical oppressive uh, weight. And it's, again, it's, it's not just uh, in the past few centuries, it's still happening today. Here's another term, master-slave, uh, definitely problematic, but also definitely being used in so many uh, contexts. Uh, most of the time it just means uh, a primary device controlling secondary devices. And why can't we just use that instead? Like, uh, it's no matter how appropriate we may think that these terminologies uh, apply to whatever we're trying to do, it doesn't make it okay to use them. And so uh, modern day slavery is still happening. All, all these languages, all these terminologies that we've been using, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, are harmful because even if, with the long history, it's, it's still happening. Here's uh, an academic essay, the, um, the Importance of Stupidity in Scientific Research. Was there really a need to say stupidity? Obviously, the, the author was just trying to grab your attention. Um, but what he was actually referring to was the ignorance of, uh, was the person's ignorance. But that, that doesn't mean it's OK also to make fun of people's intelligence, which is ableist, um, just as a side note. And um, when we use these words, these eye-catching, um, they're easy terms, they're, they're low-hanging fruit, um, we should consider our intent rather than the probable negative impact that our words may have. So again, like he could, he could not have used stupidity in this sense, but it was, it was low-hanging fruit for him, you know, it was, it was easy. And even in OJS, um, not to put OJS on the spot, but I mean, uh, this sort of language is used in academic and scholarly publishing, double blind, blind reviews. And um, this is problematic because it's ableist in nature because we kind, of, we kind of equate blindness with ignorance. And that's, uh, that's something that we should question and definitely change. I wonder if anyone else would, has any other examples that they'd like to share, um, if you have any. Anybody? Nope? OK, I'll continue. So why is it harmful? Um, the internet is global. It's a global communal context. And we're living uh, in a globalized uh, context where people of different lived experiences and histories are joining the conversation. And we should make our, our spaces safer and more inclusive, uh, regardless of disability, race, religion, gender identity, gender expression. Um, it, it's not about, it, like, there's nothing wrong with being politically, politically correct. There's nothing wrong with uh, trying to make our language and our spaces more inclusive and diverse, because these people will be joining our teams. They'll be, they'll be the ones offer, uh, they'll be the ones who we go to see the doctor to, or, um, you know, they will be everywhere. And we have to consider the impact that our language has on them. Um, and if we want, we're always talking about diversity and inclusion in our workplaces. And if we want to include these people, we have to make sure our, our language uh, affects them positively and not alienate them or disempower them. Um, even from a design perspective, we should be catering to more than the white, able-bodied person and how this leaves other people out in the cold. So yes, so we talk about inclusivity. Um, there's a lot of talk about, oh, let's make, let's make our company more inclusive, more diverse. And oftentimes, it's just a, a checkbox to be, to be checked off. But if we want to walk the talk, we, really, we, we can start with our language. Um, and and it's, it's a long road, but language is definitely a huge part of making sure that our workspaces, our, 
our friends, our colleagues, our family are all included in our language, in our, in our conversations. So what can we do? Um, we should, we all have different lived experiences. I have my own uh, experiences with uh, racism, microaggressions, and stuff like that. But we should think about also um, what power we hold and that we are able to say certain terms or words. And maybe that's something that we can start with ourselves, thinking about um, how come I can say this and it, let it not affect me, but it may affect other people. And um, uh, it's good to reflect, to take a hard look at our privilege and realize that the choice of, the choice of our words matter. Um, so again, we focus on our intent instead of uh, eye-catching or easy, low-hanging fruit words to use just because it's easy, just because we've always done it this way, just because it sounds like it has more impact. We, we should focus more on our intent and be more sincere and be more uh, inclusive of our language. So I've, I, I've got, oh sorry, I've got a few um, websites I'd like to check out um, that people have done. Uh, one of them is, is called selfdefined.app, which is a modern dictionary project by Tatiana Mack. And I will click on it. So this is the dictionary that she has developed and it's something that anybody can submit uh, contributions to and it's basically, it basically outlines all the problematic uh, terminologies that, that's been used everywhere. Not just in technology, not just in design, not just in <coughs> academia, but uh, any, any, anything that you may not may have thought was not problematic could, have, could be problematic, and this is a good way to, excuse me, to go through and check ourselves before we do or say anything that could be damaging to other people. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's a really good reference for, for, uh, for language and redefining our vocabularies. And the other link uh, is a Google document. I am not entirely sure who um, started this document, but it's an alternative, it's a document for alternatives and substitutes for appropriative and problematic language. Um, Black English or American, African American vernacular English is a huge problem. Uh, they have a lot of alternatives and the context by which it is being used and they have examples to show uh, how we can uh, reframe the way we say things or how we mean things so that it's not uh, oppressing or uh, undermining other people. So this is, this is quite a long list. Um, so they have ableist language as well, which is really important because we often take for granted, um, because as able-bodied people, we take for granted the language that we use and it alienates people who are disabled and um, may not enjoy the same privileges as, as, as we do, especially with language where we, we constantly use stupid or again in OJS, double blind, blind reviews and um, yeah, so it's good to reevaluate our terms. So going back to... So what's been done? Um, people are already or have always been talking about this and I'm definitely not the first, but I think it's important to share this with all of you so that we can continue this conversation with our teams, our people, our friends, family, colleagues. Um, become more aware of the language that we use and how it impacts people. 
An example uh, on Twitter, uh, Andre Stoltz uh, recommended to change blacklist to deny list, which makes more sense. He gives all these uh, alternatives to terms that we've always used to things that make more sense, honestly. Uh, we don't need to, to use blacklist, but we can say deny list, white list to allow list, and master and slave to primary and replica, which makes sense. Uh, Ruby on Rails, which is a programming framework, um, is also replacing the use of whitelist and, and blacklist. Python, a, pop a popular programming language, is uh, removing the master and slave terminology, which is great. Here's a tweet from someone in scholarly publishing. Change double blind or blind reviews to mutually anonymous peer review. It's a mouthful, but it's way better than what we currently have. And it makes more sense. And also, it, it, it's more uh, user friendly for people who are not familiar with these scholarly uh, terms. In Node.js, we've opened an issue to remove blind from review types. So, it's, so we're, we're taking the steps to get there. And um, we're, we're trying to be more friendly and um, not just to people who may be affected by it, but, but people who may not be familiar with what a double blind or a blind review means. So cool people talking about this. Again, Tatiana Mack, who made selfdefined.app. I want to talk about a group in Toronto uh, that I'm a part of called Intersect.io. And we're a bunch of people who are black, indigenous, people of color, trying to uplift uh, these uh, marginalized voices in the Toronto tech space because there's a lot of problematic uh, issues with that tech space. Actually, not just in Toronto, but everywhere. But I'm from Toronto, so that, that's why I wanted to give them a shout out. And there are a lot more smart people with lived experience who are BIPOC, who are disabled, queer, trans, talking about this. And some final notes. Um, we've walked through all these examples in technology and scholarly language, and it's definitely relevant for us working as developers, designers, or anyone who works in tech and scholarly publishing. Um, but it's also relevant to our daily lives and that we should be cognizant of it in our teams, whether we are in tech and design or scholarly publishing. And you may know someone who has a visible or a, an invisible disability, and it might be harming them. And it, and it really doesn't harm ourselves to be using more inclusive language. And you never know. They might be people in your teams, and we just don't know about it. So it's, it, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with being politically, politically correct. And we have the alternative vocabulary. You know, we we just have to be mindful and do a bit of reprogramming, and that doesn't he that doesn't hurt either. And I wanted to close with um, what Tatiana Max says: uh, We define our words, but they don't define us. We've been past la this language from generation to generation, but with the internet. Uh, with globalization, we can redefine our words and redefine our vocabulary to make sure that we can uh, include everyone in the conversation and learn how to better relate with, with one another. And these are my sources. I'll be um, sending the slides to Marissa, I think, so we, we can uh, go through the sources and that's it, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Lorraine Chun from Toronto, uh, Julian Lian uh, from the Bay Area, Sophie Ush, who is a colleague of mine at PKP for uh, helping me with these slides because this is my first talk and I was very nervous. But thank you so much and yeah, let's do better. Yeah.